Hi everyone, and welcome to week 9 of Introduction to Causal Inference. This week we'll be going through difference in differences, estimation, and synthetic controls. I'll be giving the part of the lecture on difference in differences, and it will be shorter than the lectures that we've had in the past weeks, but then we'll have a whole other lecture on synthetic controls from Alberto Abadi later in the week. Last week, with instrumental variables, we started covering some causal inference techniques from economics, and we're going to continue that this week with difference and differences. Difference and differences is a very common method that you might see used in economics or neighboring fields such as political science. As always, go ahead and leave any questions or comments that come up during the course of the lecture in the YouTube comments section down below. Here is the lecture outline. We'll start by motivating difference in differences, and then consider some necessary preliminaries. Then I'll give you an overview of the method before we jump into the formal assumptions and proof of the method. And finally, we'll cover some important problems with difference in differences. So the context for difference in differences is a bit different than what we've seen so far. Importantly, there's an aspect of time. So we'll still have a treatment group and a control group, but the treatment group won't get treatment until a certain point in time. So here we have the outcome on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis here. And the control group's outcome is going to change over time, even though we haven't given them the treatment at all. Unlike the treatment group, who will not get the treatment until a specific point in time. So they're going to be just like the control group in terms of the fact that they won't have the treatment up until this point, and then after that they will have the treatment. So the treatment's administered at a specific point in time to the treatment group, not to the control group. And the fact that we have this time dimension now is going to be helpful. So we're going to use the fact that we observe these groups over time to help us with identification. Here's a popular example from this Card and Kruger 1994 paper. They wanted to study the causal effect of increasing minimum wage on employment. So the treatment group here was New Jersey. New Jersey was going to have a new increase in minimum wage law go into effect at this specific point in time with the dotted line. And then the control group was the neighboring state, Pennsylvania, who wasn't going to have any minimum wage increase. Okay, so we see that employment in the control group in Pennsylvania is just going down over time in this graph. That shouldn't really have anything to do with the treatment because of the control group. They're not getting the treatment. And then we see that in the treatment group, we see a different trend. And we're going to use these differences in these trends to get our causal effect estimate. But before we do that, there's one important preliminary that we haven't seen yet in the course, which is the average treatment effect on the treated. So we've seen the average treatment effect, and we've seen that under the unconfoundedness assumption here, so that's where the potential outcomes are both independent of treatment. Alternatively, you could think of this as there's no backdoor path from T to Y in the causal graph. Under this assumption, we have the following identification. So we can get the average treatment effect as just the difference in these conditional expectations in the treatment group versus the control group. But there are other causal estimates to be interested in. So for example, one really common one is the average treatment effect on the treated, which we'll denote as ATT. So this is just the average treatment effect, but now we are specifically looking at the treated group. We're conditioning on t equals 1. So we don't care about the average treatment effect in the control group, if this is the estimate we're interested in. And with this estimate, we don't need to make as strong of an unconfoundedness assumption. So here we only needed to assume that the potential outcome y0 is independent of treatment, rather than both potential outcomes. And under this assumption, we have that we get the same identification. And we'll go ahead and prove that really quickly since it's only a few steps. The first step is the usual application of linearity of expectation. Then if you look at this first term, which is a causal term because it has a potential outcome in it, so y1 given t equals 1, because the potential outcome, the number in the parentheses there, 
matches the treatment that we're conditioning on, we can use consistency to just identify that. It just turns into the regular conditional expectation. We can just remove the potential outcome because we're conditioning on t equals that same value. But this second term is counterfactual. So the potential outcome y0, the 0 doesn't match the t equals 1, so it's counterfactual. Here's where we need to use our weaker unconfoundedness assumption. So because y0 is independent of treatment, we can just turn that into, we could either remove the t or we can change it to t equals 0. Here we change the conditioning to t equals 0, so then we can use consistency again to then identify this last term. And that completes the proof. This brings us to our first question, which is, what is the difference between the ATE and the ATT? We'll now move on to an overview of difference and differences. In this slide, we'll take us from stuff that we've seen a bunch of times before to a setting where we have time involved. So we'll often be using vertical or the y-axis to represent the value of various points. These values are the average outcome in the treated group and the average outcome in the control group. And then the difference between them, which we're representing as space on the vertical or the y-axis, this difference is equal to the average treatment effect on the treated given that we have this specific unconfoundedness here where y0 is independent of treatment, right? This is what we just showed a couple slides ago. So that's the estimand we're interested in when we don't have any time involved. And by introducing time, we'll be able to get rid of this unconfoundedness assumption. We'll have to make other assumptions, but we're not going to need this specific unconfoundedness assumption. All right, so let's get rid of that and put in an axis for time here. So we've been using the y-axis for the values, and we're going to use the x-axis for time. And we're going to put time in the subscript for y. So we're going to call those quantities y sub 1 to denote that it's a time 1. And then because we have access to our data in our treated and control group over time, we also have access to them at time 0. So here we have y sub 0 to denote time 0. These top two points are the treatment group, and the bottom two points are the control group, the averages in the treatment and control group respectively. And now rather than having one point for the treatment group and one point for the control group, we have two because we're measuring these groups both before and after treatment. So there's some time in between t equals 0 and t equals 1 where treatment was administered. So of the four points on the slide, only the top right point represents data where they received the treatment. So not only do you have to be in the treatment group, the group that will receive treatment, but you also have to be at a time after the treatment was administered. The treatment group hadn't received treatment at time t equals 0, so this point doesn't, doesn't really have treatment involved in it. And then the points in the control group, they never are involved with treatment. They're the control group, they're never going to receive treatment. So for these ones that do receive treatment, y1 given t equals 1, we want to know the potential outcome y sub 1, 1, so that's if they do receive treatment, minus the potential outcome when they don't receive treatment. And that's something that we won't observe because we're specifically looking at the treatment group where everyone's going to be receiving treatment at time t equals 1. But so by the consistency assumption, we have that this quantity in the top right is equal to the first term in that ATT estimate with time involved on the bottom there. And then we want to know what's going to happen with the other term, the y1, 0, given t equals 1. So that's for the treatment group. After they've been administered treatment, what average outcome would they have observed had they not been administered treatment? So what we'll do in difference and differences is we'll use the control group for this. We'll say, okay, the control group went up from 
this point down here to this point over here over time without receiving any treatment. So in the treat treated group, they would have gone up similarly if they did not receive treatment. So using those two blue points on the bottom and then the red point on the bottom left, we can extrapolate to get that we will estimate this potential outcome, this average potential outcome, using those three points. Then once we have that, then we just take the difference between that and the top red point to get the average treatment effect on the treated. And to get this counterfactual point that we have in gray here, we're going to may need to make some assumptions. So we're just going to assume away this question mark. And we'll go into those assumptions in a bit. But first, I just have to tell you a bit more about what difference in differences is to complete this overview of difference in differences. So I've actually written the identification equation for difference in differences on the bottom here. On the left-hand side of this equation, we have the causal estimate we're interested in, the average treatment effect on the treated. And then on the right-hand side, we have points that are all statistical estimates. These are all things that we can estimate from data. Right, so the first one here is just this red point up here. Then this one here is the red point down here. And this one here is a blue point here. And then this one is also a blue point right here. Okay, so what's the intuition for this equation? Why is it called difference in differences? That's what we'll quickly answer in this overview slide. This first group of terms here corresponds to the vertical distance between the two terms. So it corresponds to this guy minus this guy, and I'm denoting that with this vertical distance. Similarly, this second group of terms corresponds to this vertical distance between the blue points. So this guy matches this guy, and then this guy matches this guy. So we're just subtracting them to get the vertical distance. That's how we're graphically visualizing this. Then, as we said, we're using the difference between those blue points to try to figure out this gray point along with using this red point down here. So just move up that, that blue distance. And now all that's left is to just take the difference between this red, which is this group of terms, and this blue, which is this group of terms. So when you take that difference, then all that's left is this black one there, which is now all denoted as purple. And if the gray point is really this counterfactual here, then that purple distance is equal to exactly the causal estimate that we were interested in estimating. And one of the cool things about difference in differences is that it can tolerate some amount of unobserved confounding. So unobserved confounding that's very specific in the sense that if there are unobserved confounders that are time invariant, they don't change over time, then those are something we won't need to worry about with difference in differences. It can handle those. So because they're time invariant, they're going to cancel out when we take this difference, for example, this one right here, where the only thing that's different between the, these two terms, so they're both in the treatment group, the only thing that's different is that they have a different time subscript. So if the unobserved confounder is constant over time, then it's going to ca get canceled out in that difference. So that's a cool little thing that we get from difference in differences and other methods that take differences over time, like fixed effects methods, which we won't go into. But that completes our overview of difference in differences on the previous slide, and a cool little thing about them on this slide. So I'll leave you with this question. On the bottom here, I have the difference in differences equation. So the causal estimate on the left, and then the corresponding statistical estimate on the right. And the question is, how would you estimate the terms on the right-hand side of the difference in differences equation below? since all I've given you here is identification, not estimation. We'll now more formally introduce the assumptions that we need for difference in differences and give the proof to show that difference in differences works, that we can identify the causal effect, the ATT, the average treatment effect on the treated. 
First, we'll just extend the consistency assumption to the setting where there's time. So now we have some time tau that shows up in the subscript for the outcome. And this consistency assumption just says that if treatment, big T, is little t, if it takes on the specific value little t in the data, then the observed value of outcome y sub tau is equal to the potential outcome that we would have observed at time tau if we'd gotten treatment little t. So this is just consistency where we've added in this tau subscript here and then said that this holds for all times tau. So here are some examples. If we have the causal estimate, the average potential outcome under treatment at time tau, given that we're in the treatment group, then because we're in that treatment group, t equals 1, we're conditioning on t equals 1, we actually observe that potential outcome under treatment. And that means that we can identify this causal estimate as this statistical estimate here, where we've just removed the potential outcome. So just as before, we have causal estimates when we have potential outcomes and statistical estimates. These are things that we can estimate from the observational data when we don't have any potential outcomes. So here, that's just the parentheses here. The subscript tau isn't important for whether it's a potential outcome or not, right? Because we observe data at every time step. And then it's the same for the control group. If you're interested in the other potential outcome under no treatment, given that you're in the control group, then you can identify this causal estimate as the statistical estimate where you just have the observed outcome at time tau. This is in contrast to counterfactual quantities, where here, if we were interested in the outcome under treatment at time tau, but we're in the control group, this is something that we can't identify with consistency. We need more assumptions for identifying this because this is a counterfactual quantity. We don't directly observe this. And then same for this other one here. So if we were interested in the potential outcome under no treatment, if we are not in the control group, we're in the treatment group, then that's a counterfactual quantity. Consistency doesn't tell us anything about that. Okay, so that was just extending the consistency assumption. And now we're going to see what's probably the defining assumption for difference in differences, the parallel trends assumption. So we were interested in identifying this ATT quantity here, but we needed some assumptions to identify that. And the main thing that we noted is that we observe these two blue points so we can get the difference between them. And we observe this bottom red point, so we can add this difference onto this bottom red point to get what we hope to be this counterfactual quantity that we've denoted by this gray point. Okay, so the parallel trends assumption is that these two vertical distances between the two blue points and between the red and the gray point are the same. These two blue intervals are of the same length. An equivalent way of saying that is that this black line connecting the two blue points and the dotted gray line connecting the red and the gray point are the same slope. In other words, they're parallel lines. That's why it's called the parallel trends assumption. Okay, so we're saying that we can get this counterfactual quantity from this observed quantity and these two observed quantities by assuming that when we increase from this quantity where we don't have treatment to a quantity that we still don't have treatment but now some time has passed, we're assuming that the increase would be the same as it was in the control group where we also didn't have treatment. That's the kind of graphical picture to have in mind and then writing down the parallel trends assumption mathematically looks like this. So on the left-hand side here, this term exactly matches this term. And we're saying minus, so that's this vertical distance, this term, where this term equals this term because of something that we'll see on the next slide. And these two terms equal this term and this term because of just consistency. 
So we're in the control group Y0 and Y0. So we can just throw in the zero potential outcome there. Okay, but why is this term equal to this one right here, right? So this has the potential outcome zero, which doesn't match the treatment. Treatment equals one. So we can't just use consistency to get from this guy to this guy. So that's what we'll see now with the no pretreatment effect assumption. And we'll just go ahead and write this right away on the bottom here. We have the no pretreatment effect assumption tells us that these two quantities are equal. So what are the two quantities here? One on the right hand side is this one, which we saw on the previous slide. And then this one is equal to this quantity, which we observed by consistency, because t equals one, so we can just throw in the potential outcome one there. And then this is one we want to know on the previous slide. We'll see a more clear use of this assumption in the proof that's coming up shortly. And it might be, seem obvious, like this assumption should always be satisfied. So what is this assumption saying? It's saying that there's no treatment effect here in the treatment group before the treatment's been administered, that there's no treatment effect there. It's like, well, of course, the treatment hasn't been administered. So why would there be a treatment effect? But there are cases where this assumption is violated. So for example, if people are anticipating the treatment that they'll be getting soon, then they might act a bit differently than if they weren't anticipating that they would get that treatment. So the treatment does have some effect on them. So this is something to make sure is actually satisfied. This assumption is actually satisfied if you're using difference and differences in practice. All right, so before we get to the proof, let's kind of take stock and compare the assumptions we have now to ones that we've seen throughout this course. So I'll put the causal estimate we're interested in on the left and the assumption on the right, the assumption that helps us identify that causal estimate. The thing that we saw initially was the average treatment effect on the treated when we didn't have any time. Okay, so this is the ATE. If you didn't condition on T equals one here, that's just the ATE, and that's the thing that we've been interested in all throughout this course. I just have the ATT here, so it's gonna be a bit more comparable to the estimate that we see that it does involve time now. So the assumption that's important for identifying this causal estimate is this unconfoundedness assumption, where Y0 is independent of treatment. And we're gonna contrast that with the assumption that we use for difference and differences. So here is the quantity we care about for difference and differences. It's the same as the above one, but now, because time is involved, we have to specify that we're specifically interested in time one, right? So that's after treatment has happened. And the defining assumption here is the parallel trends assumption. So this assumption is saying that this difference of the potential outcomes under no treatment, where the difference is between the potential outcome under no treatment at time one and under no treatment at time zero, this difference is equal in both the treated group and the control group. That's the parallel trends assumption. So because it's in both treatment groups, it doesn't matter which treatment group you're in, you could think of this as an independence assumption where instead of it being this single potential outcome Y0 that's independent of T, and now it's actually this difference that we're assuming is independent of T, this difference across time. So it's still Y0 in both cases, but the first one is Y0 at time one after treatment has been administered, and the second one is Y0 at time zero before treatment was administered. So parallel trends is kind of like this unconfoundedness in difference space assumption. And we could have specified it as mean independence, right? So this is mean independence here, and then this is full independence. So it's a bit stronger of an assumption, but it's just a bit easier to look at this independence and this independence than mean independence ones. And with all those assumptions out of the way, where we can get to the proof. So recall that difference in differences, what we're interested in showing is that this quantity, the ATT, is equal to the difference between this difference and this difference, where the graphical intuition for this first two terms is this whole red vertical, and then the blue is this 
blue vertical, which by the parallel trends is we get from this blue vertical. And then we're taking the difference between this red and this blue to get this purple. So that's what this equation you can think of is going on in this equation graphically. And now we're going to prove this equation using these assumptions that we just covered. All right, so here is that equation with the causal estimate on the top left and the statistical estimate on the bottom right. As usual, the first thing we do is apply linearity of expectation. Then we can immediately identify this first term on the right hand side using the consistency assumption. So basically, what we need to do to identify this ATT causal estimate is to identify this specific counterfactual causal estimate here. So if you look at the common trends assumption, that term shows up right here. So this guy is this guy. So if we just solve for this guy, then we get this. And the last two terms here are terms that we can just reduce using consistency to these statistical estimates here, just these conditional expectations. Now, unfortunately, we still have a counterfactual term here, this guy. So it's different from this guy and that now we're at treatment or sorry, now we're at time zero rather than at time one like we were here. Okay, so how do we identify this guy? And that's where the no pretreatment effect assumption comes into play. So this term shows up exactly here. The no pretreatment effect assumption tells us that this term equals this term. So we can just substitute in that term. And now we finally have a term that we can identify. So here, the potential outcome one matches the treatment group one. So we can just use the consistency assumption to turn that into this conditional expectation with no potential outcomes involved. And that's it. Now all that remains, now that we've removed potential outcomes from this term, is just plug this term back in up here, and that gives us this. Then just by regrouping terms, we get this more familiar difference in differences. So this is the difference in differences, or these two, equation. That completes the proof. All right, so this slide is a bunch of equations and stuff, but what about the graphical intuition? That's the next question. What is the graphical intuition behind the various parts of the proof and assumptions on the previous slide? Unfortunately, there are quite a few serious problems with difference and differences, and we'll cover some of the bigger ones in this part of the lecture. The first is it's probably not uncommon to have violations of the parallel trends assumption. One cool thing that you can do is when you have a violation of the parallel trends assumption, just condition on some variables W here that hopefully will give you parallel trends. So it's a bit like when before we were saying, okay, we need to block some backdoor paths. So let's condition on these variables to block these backdoor paths. Now we have this sort of difference analog of that. So that was to get independence between the potential outcome, like just one of these, and treatment. We had to condition on W, but now we have this difference analog here. So maybe conditioning on some variables, W can help you ameliorate your violation of parallel trends, and then you get parallel trends conditional on W, which is fine. You can still do difference and differences estimation there. But maybe something more annoying is that whenever you have an interaction term between treatment and time in the structural equation that generates the outcome y, that means you have a parallel trends violation. So whenever that's the case, you can't have this equality or this, you always have an inequality here between these two or between the analog with w here. Whenever t and tau, so treatment and time interact in their production of the outcome. So that's a pretty major thing that you might worry about when you're using difference and differences methods. And so consider this one where we're conditioning on W here to get parallel trends. What would we need to additionally assume? So when we condition on W to get parallel trends, that's this equation that I've just replicated here. What additional assumption do we need to satisfy now that we're conditioning on W?
All right, so say that you do have parallel trends satisfied, that's what we have here, but you're interested in your outcome, not quite in the space just y here. You're interested in a different space, so some transformation of y. Unfortunately, when you have parallel trends in this space for y, you don't necessarily have it in transformations of y. So for example, with log, this is a common transformation you might do. You might take the logarithm of your outcome. Having parallel trends here does not imply this parallel trend in the logarithmic space. So this is in contrast to the usual unconfoundedness we look at, where we just have yt, so the potential outcome under treatment t is independent of treatment, big T. When we're just looking at that, the scale or the transformation of y doesn't matter. That independence will hold always because you're not looking at a difference. But now that we're looking at a difference, it's like adding a bit of a functional form assumption. And this is a bit unsatisfying, say, to machine learning people or other people who really like more flexible functional forms, as this basically means that the parallel trends assumption isn't a non-parametric assumption. It is a bit of a parametric assumption. Okay, so for example, take the COM estimators that we had back in the estimation week. All the identification going on there was all non-parametric. But here, parallel trends is more like semi-parametric, which is a bit less satisfying. And this is because the parallel trends assumption is inherently about a difference. So this this difference here is a very kind of specific semi-parametric form. Okay, so that concludes the problems with difference and differences. And I'll ask you a few questions about these to make sure that you've internalized these important problems. The first is, is parallel trends satisfied if time and treatment interact in producing the outcome? And the second question is, if parallel trends is satisfied, is it also satisfied for arbitrary transformations of the outcome variable? With that, we'll conclude our lecture on difference and differences. Make sure to go check out the lecture on synthetic controls, not by me, but by the expert on the topic, Alberto Abadi. If that lecture is not out yet, one way you can make sure you know when it's out is by subscribing and hitting the bell icon below. If you like these lectures and you want to help me out with my self-esteem that I derive from likes on these lectures, go ahead and smash that thumbs up button below. Thanks for watching.